11.30, what time is it, 11.30 a.m.? Glad you guys are with us today. Um, I said this earlier, but I love this time of year. I mean, obviously, because it's Easter, I'm a pastor, um, I'm gonna preach, but I, I love everything about this time of year. Just real quick, shout out, because what better time than Easter? I love it that um, the Rays are undefeated right now. So it's just seems like a perfect time to give them a shout out. The Bolts are in the playoffs again, so I love that part of the season. And I love Easter, and that's not like the prioritization of my life, but those are a big deal, and today's a big deal. And I seriously, I love talking about what we're going to talk about, even though like the ending never changes. Like I got to preach about Easter every year, and there's no alternate ending. But as much as people, specifically in our cultural context, have heard about this story, there's a part of it that I, I think sometimes is missing where we don't understand um, how inclusive the story is and how much weight there is to it. And so, in fact, if you're going to really understand the Easter story, you actually have to start midway through the story, like right after Jesus is at the height of his popularity, and then everything turns on a dime. Like they thought his followers that he's about to be crowned a king, and then he's crucified. Like they thought in their minds he's about to win, and they had all kind of ideas about what winning looked like, and now the movement's over. And there's no more teaching or faith to move this thing beyond that weekend. In fact, this is what you really have to understand to get the point of this, is that on Easter weekend, midway through, there were no Christians, there were no followers, like everybody unfollowed Jesus, there were no heroes, and there was no great faith. And that's really important because here's the big question that leads you to is that if that's all there was to Jesus, and I get it, in our culture, that's a lot of people's opinion. Like, dude introduced an ethic to the first century that kind of changed the world. He was a great teacher. He was a great guy, but he died, and that's kind of the end of it. If that's all there was to Jesus midway through Easter weekend, the questions that historians are still trying to answer is, how in the world then, then 2,000 years later, love Jesus, hate Jesus, his name is dominating the globe. Like, how did the movement survive? How did we get here if that's all there was to Jesus? Great teacher, introduced a new ethic to the first century, and then he died. The only explanation is a singular event in history that changed everything and reignited the movement when right before that, nobody had any faith, Everybody unfollowed. There was no reason to continue on and then it all changed. And here's why that is great news for you and really great news for everybody at some point along the way when they realize it. Because maybe you've thought like you're always on the outside because of maybe your past or your doubts or your dysfunction. The amazing part of this story is the launch of our movement was people with doubts and cynicism and skepticism, screw-ups, disbelievers, and then something happened that changed their mind and it began to move this movement out of the first century. And that's great news because it says to every single one of us who've ever found ourselves in that place that you are a part of this story. These are your people more than you realize and it actually is the message of Easter. In fact, um, the guy that's maybe the most famous leader, Peter, who is talking big, over-promises, under-delivers again and again, the guy that, you know, monuments would be built after him. You just need to know where he was at middle of Easter weekend. In fact, right before this, he was the guy that was most confident. In fact, Luke records that he told Jesus when Jesus was talking about what was gonna happen, Peter turned to him and said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. And then Jesus turns to Peter, he's like, nah, you'll lose faith too. Like you'll walk away too. Your doubt is gonna get the best of you as well. And in fact, you're gonna deny me three times when all of this goes down. But I'm just telling you, you're not gonna maintain faith. And what we miss about Peter is that like, this is the guy that was all in. If anybody wanted the God thing to be true, it was Peter. If anybody wanted this thing to stay alive, it was Peter. And yet on Easter weekend, as Jesus is beginning to be led away and Peter keeps eye contact with him and he knows the inevitability of a crucifixion, that his leader is gonna die, which means he's another one to be but Messiah. Peter and all the rest of his followers were struggling with all the same things that we struggle. Same things that kind of keep us in disconnection with God. The first thing that Peter was struggling with, it was a religious leader who had failed him. Because at this point, Jesus was not who Jesus claimed to be in their minds if he's about to die. Because unlike other religions, Jesus was the message. Jesus said crazy things like, I want you to believe in me. 
Not believe in my teachings, believe in me. Jesus was the movement. He said other ridiculous things like this that are either true or he's a lunatic. He said, I'm the resurrection and I'm the life, which means Jesus was the message. He was the movement. No Jesus, no, you know, no reason to continue on. And maybe that's, you know, your story is in our context, a failed leader, somebody who stood on a stage like this and wasn't who they said they were. Spiritual trauma. You're being let down at some point and, and it marked you in such a way that it's like, I just don't know if I can believe in the God thing. And then the second reason that Peter and all the rest were struggling was because it no longer made any sense. There was no longer anything to gain. And can we just be honest for a second, for us, just a second in church? Like sometimes it's not a theological issue that we struggle with. Our disconnection with God is it gets to a point where it costs us and there's just really nothing to gain any longer in our own minds. And there they are, and Jesus is about to die. The movement is about to be over, and there was nothing to gain. In fact, if you would have gone up to his followers at that point to go, okay, well, once he dies, you should steal his body and make up a story and try to keep the movement alive. Well, okay, well, if we do that, what do we win? Uh, probably a nationwide manhunt. You'll be crucified for it. Like every other religion study it. When people get it started, they usually have something to gain around the lines of sex, money, power. None of Jesus' followers had anything to gain. It just wasn't practical. And then the third thing, like some of us, their circumstances just didn't make sense. If Jesus is a king, if Jesus is a Messiah, it doesn't go down like this. Kings don't get crucified. Messiahs don't get killed. And again, like that's some of the things that we struggle with sometimes. If there's a God and he's good, how do I reconcile that with my unanswered prayers or my suffering or the betrayal or the divorce or the breakup or the fact that like I'm stuck in this place that I didn't thought I would be, I didn't thought I would be here at this point in my life. And it just feels like if God is good and God's with me, it wouldn't go down that way. And that's exactly where every single follower and disciple of Jesus were at that weekend. Everybody had given up hope. Nobody had any faith. Everybody was willing to walk away. And so Peter gets to that moment that Jesus had predicted and he stays within the eye contact of Jesus who's being led away to his own death. And he's by a fire pit and he has three different people approach him to go, hey, aren't you that guy that was with Jesus? He's like, no, I'm, aren't, are you sure? Aren't you the Galilean? No, 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 I'm not the guy. Then an elementary school age girl approaches him and Peter is so afraid out of his mind that he starts dropping explicatives and he's like, I don't know Jesus, I'm not with him. And then he realizes, and just as Jesus predicted, the rooster crows, and he makes eye contact and it's hard to overestimate the drama and Luke records it, that the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter realized, as much as I wanted to hold on, as much as I wanted to maintain faith, as, what, as much as I wanted it to be true, he went out and he wept bitterly because it's over. And he still had respect for Jesus like all the rest. And he still believed Jesus was a good guy, but he's not a Messiah. He's not a king. And I just, this is a really important point. This wasn't an act of rebellion on Peter's part of like, just forget God, I'm gonna do my own thing or you know, forget Jesus, I'm not following that any longer. He wanted to follow. He wanted to maintain faith, but there was no reason to continue on. And he couldn't just muster up faith or just muster up belief when the very object for his belief in faith was no longer gonna be around. In fact, maybe well-meaning um, Christians have said to you at some point along the way in your own journey, if you've ever questioned or doubted, hey, you just need to have more faith. You just need to, you just need to believe, which I just, I'm gonna confirm what you've thought. That is the most ridiculous thing to tell anybody in the world. If you want to be intellectually honest, you can't, if you don't believe, you can't just decide to have belief. If you don't have faith, you can't just make up a reason to have faith. What are you gonna have faith in faith? In fact, here's what I would tell you that may blow up your Sunday school theology if you grew up in the church. You can't decide to just have more faith in God. You need a reason. In fact, that's the biblical definition of faith throughout the scriptures that may help some of you in this journey because you thought you had to kind of throw away your intellect to follow Jesus. Jesus never invited you to just have faith in faith or just believe. Jesus came to give, it, give us an object for our faith, a reason for our faith and anchor it in history so that you could have faith in something that was verifiable, something that was documented, a reason to believe. Following Jesus does not mean abandoning your intellect. So let's just give John and Peter and all the rest a break. At this point, middle Easter weekend, there was no reason for them to believe. 
There's no reason for them to have any faith. There is no reason to keep the movement alive, which leads us to a really important question. If that's all there is to the story of Jesus, every secular historian would agree that he lived and he died, but if it just stayed there, how in the world are we here? And so maybe you know the story after this, two women, after this all goes down and Jesus is indeed crucified, they go a couple of days later to the tomb. And again, I, I just wanna say what is obvious. They had no faith. They had no hope. Like there's no Christian selling t-shirts outside of the tomb going, hey, any day now he promised that he's coming back. Like no expectation. And the women make their way toward the tomb and Mark records it, interviewing Peter that when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so they might go, so they might go and anoint Jesus' body. And again, this is obvious, but I, just, I want us to just stay in the story before we get to the end of the weekend. They go to anoint or literally embalm Jesus' body because Jesus' body is dead. And they expect what every one of us expects is when somebody dies, they stay dead. And their hope and their faith in the movement is over. And then every year I read this, I can't help but come to this conclusion too. And this is not in a commentary, but little known fact, earlier in the weekend, a couple guys had already been to the tomb. They had anointed Jesus' body and embalmed Jesus' body with spices. And so later in the weekend, the women are like, there's no way they did that right. And so they went back on Sunday to re-embalm re the body of Jesus, which is why they were there. And so very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they're on their way to the tomb and they ask each other, and they should have thought about this, who rolled the stone of the, of the entrance to the tomb away? Which, this is hilarious to me. Every single follower of Jesus at this point is huddled up trying to figure out how they can get out of the city under the cover of night, terrified. They just killed their leader, they're gonna kill them. There's no reason to continue on. Jesus was the message and the movement. And so literally the religious leaders put a massive several hundred pound stone, sealed it in front of the tomb because they were afraid the Jesus followers would somehow get enough courage to go steal the body and make up a story. Little do they know they're all huddled up. They're all terrified. Literally the religious leaders have more faith in Jesus followers than Jesus followers have in Jesus followers. For them, it's all over. And the women get there and they're trying to figure out what they do with the massive stone. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. And John's actually, he's interviewing Peter as he's writing this. And he's like, as they entered the tomb and Peter's like, okay, or Mark as he's writing, it's like, okay, Peter, let's just run through this one more time. Can you go, can you take the story from the top? And Peter's like, yeah, yeah. So what happened was the women got there and then we can't, oh, Mark's like, let me stop you one more time. Go back one more time. Are you sure, like Peter, are you absolutely sure that, that you know, you and John didn't get there maybe a hair before the women? Like, are you sure they were the first there? And Peter's like, no, 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 they were the first there. We were actually all still terrified. We were huddled up. We were trying to figure out what to do and how to get out of the city. And I think Mark hesitates to write this because if you know first century culture, this actually gives validity to the story. If you wanna make something up that people are gonna believe in that culture, you would never put women as central figures in the story and as first to get to an empty tomb. They had no credibility. They couldn't be called as witnesses in court. Nobody would believe this. If you're making up a story, you can look at this for yourself. If this is terrible fiction, nobody would make this up. And I think Mark's like, okay, Peter, tell me one more time. And then Mark finally writes that these women were first to get to the empty tune and see the stone rolled away. And the only reason that Mark would write that is because women were first to get to the empty tomb and to see that the stone had been rolled away and they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And this is an understatement of the world and they were alarmed. And then the angel says the maybe most unhelpful thing an angel has ever said in that moment, do not be alarmed. <laughs> and they're thinking, no, that's exactly what we're gonna be. Like we, did, we got here expecting to see the body of who we thought was gonna be a savior, rabbi, king, it's all for naught, but we still have enough respect for Jesus that we're gonna show up. And not only do we not see him, all the linen is folded up nice and neatly. He's not in there. And we're talking to a teenage angel. We're alarmed. And the women are terrified. And again, this is the moment where you would think the music starts to swell and they start to understand what's happening and connect the dots and remember what Jesus said when the angel turns to them, eyeball to eyeball and says, the reason he's not here, the reason that the tomb is empty, the hinge point of the movement 
He's risen. He's done exactly what he said. And the women at this point, you would think if you're writing the story would go, yeah, yeah, that, that's right. That's exactly what he said he was gonna do. He told us over and over again, we weren't really getting it, but this is the moment where all the dots connect, an empty tomb, we're talking to an angel. Jesus rose from the dead. Nobody thinks that. The women are alarmed. They're astonished. They're overwhelmed, but nobody still has any faith. And nobody's thinking about a resurrection. And so the angel says to them, in the midst of their still cluelessness and doubting, he's not here. And I love this, but go. Go tell all the followers and the disciples and everybody who's followed Jesus for several years and they watched him give sight to the blind. They watched him raise the dead. They watched him tell the lame to get up and walk. Go tell all of them who are cowering and hiding and who have lost all faith. Oh, wait, wait, wait. And before you leave, this is so personal and such a big deal. Go, Go tell Peter. No, no, I want you to tell all of them that Jesus isn't here, that he's, but I want you to personally pull Peter aside and let Peter know that Jesus did exactly what Jesus said he would do. And that Peter did exactly what Jesus said he would do. And yet Jesus is coming for him anyway. And he's not coming to condemn him. He's coming to restore him. And in this moment, basically the message to Peter, so personal, Peter who carried the most shame and the most regret for abandoning and losing faith in Jesus, Jesus' message to the angel was, Peter, you may have abandoned me, but I've not abandoned you. And if there were limits to God's grace and love, they would have been exposed in that moment. And if doubters and skeptics and cynics and screw ups were not invited as part of the story, there would be no story because those were the only people who were left at this moment on Easter weekend. And so the women hear the story of the angel and they run back to all of these followers who are huddled up and terrified and they're probably out of breath going, we don't know what happened but there's no stone and the cloth is all folded up. There is no sign of Jesus. And we talked to what we think was an angel. And I know it doesn't make any sense. I know it's crazy and we're still not sure what's happening, but I'm just telling you, we don't have answers to your questions, but Jesus isn't in there. And they get back. And again, this is where you would think, okay, if you're making up a movement, this is where somebody gets it to click. Somebody has some faith. Somebody realizes what's happening. And yet the women get back. They tell the whole story. And here's Luke's recording of these guys' response. But they did not believe the women. Because nobody believed women in that culture. Because their words, like some of us, seemed to them like nonsense because they believed, you know, as, as far behind as they were and as advanced as we think we are now, they believed 2000 years ago what we believe now, which is dead people stay dead. And it's the end of the story. And whatever you ladies saw, you got it wrong. There's no way that Jesus is gone. And again, still nobody is thinking about a resurrection. I'm just telling you, you don't have to believe any of this and you can go your way and, and do whatever you want, but I, you just need to consider this one point. Without an empty tomb, there would be no reason for the movement to ever be reignited and ever last beyond that weekend. In fact, to think that somehow a group of followers got together and to go, let's just try to have some faith in Jesus' teachings because people need to hear about this stuff and we don't want this movement to die even though Jesus died and even though Jesus is not exactly who we thought he was. Nobody had that kind of faith. Faith did not create Christianity because again, Jesus was the object of their faith. And without Jesus, there was no message and there was no movement and there was no reason to continue on. Second thing is, a stolen body couldn't have created Christianity because these individuals, I mean, go study the gospels. Not a single one of them was willing to die for Jesus while Jesus was alive at the height of his popularity, when he was protected by the crowds, when everything was going great and all the trend lines were up and to the right. They certainly weren't gonna die for Jesus after Jesus was dead and they knew it was a lie because without Jesus and if Jesus had stayed dead, the entire thing was a lie. Jesus was not who Jesus said he was. A stolen body didn't create Christianity. And a made up story didn't create Christianity. Because listen, and again, look at it for yourself. If you're trying to make up a story of first century culture that you want people to believe, you are never gonna write the leaders of the new movement in as cowards and as faithless and as doubters and clueless 
the entire time. You're not gonna write women in as the first to get to an empty tomb because nobody would believe that. And it's a side note, you're not gonna go with the story of a bodily resurrection. You're gonna try to, you know, peddle some kind of story of a spiritual resurrection that you can play off because a bodily resurrection is too easy to disprove. Josephus, first century historian, could have just walked to the tomb to go, no, body's here, write it down. That ends it right there. We're not even talking about it 2000 years later. A made up story could not have created Christianity. And then final point, and I'll move on because this is so important for some of you and such a big deal depending on what you were taught. The Bible could not have created Christianity. There was no the Bible as you know it, this bound library for hundreds of years after that. There was scraps of writings of eyewitnesses and documentation of eyewitnesses in the Torah, but there was no completed Bible. And you just need to know this. Without the resurrection, there would have been no reason for a the Bible. You would not have the Bible. The, the, the resurrection is the thing that created and launched Christianity and the resurrection is the thing that birthed the Bible and the reason we have the documentation today. But the Bible didn't birth Christianity any more than your birth certificate birthed you is a documentation of what happened. And you know what happened in between those hundreds of years before this thing was bound and completed so that the common person had access to the scriptures? Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people, including the very people alive at Jesus' time, placed their faith and trust in Jesus, believing that he was actually the King, the Messiah and the resurrected savior. And Matthew sat down and wrote about it. And then Mark and then Luke investigated and then John, who was one of the first to the empty tomb. And then Paul comes along and he is an enemy of Christianity and then believes that Jesus was a resurrected savior, writes two thirds of the New Testament, explodes the church all over the Mediterranean rim. James, the brother of Jesus, just quick pause. James, the brother of Jesus, rightfully so, thought at the beginning of Easter weekend that his brother was a lunatic. To be fair to James, if your brother or sister predicted to you that they were a king, messiah, and savior, that they were gonna die and come back to life, you would think they were a lunatic. At the end of Easter weekend, James, the brother of Jesus, thought that his brother was a king, a lord, messiah, and resurrected savior. I say this every year to quote a mentor of mine, but it's just important to note because I think it helps, gives weight to this. If you have a brother or sister, just think about this one question. What would you have to do to convince your brother or sister that you were lord and savior? The only thing that would do it would be a bodily resurrection. And these guys wrote about it, interviewed eyewitnesses, documented, preserved it. And this is so important. And eventually they gave their lives for it. And they did not give their lives for what they believed. People do that all over the world every day among every religion. This is what separates the Jesus movement. They gave their lives for what they say they saw. A resurrected Jesus. And they're not connecting the dots. So all of the followers are worried and they are scared to death and they're figuring out how they get out of town without getting the same fate as Jesus. And they are terrified out of their minds. And this is one of the funniest parts of all the scripture. While all of them are huddled up days later trying to figure out what to do, Jesus just walks through the wall and is like, hey guys, what are you doing? And Luke records, he just shows up in a room out of nowhere to go, I'm here. And they're terrified out of their mind. And Jesus shows up to these guys. And I just, I just want you to linger on this point for a second. Think about all the things he could have said to them in that moment. With what they did and the behavior they displayed that weekend, their doubt, their dysfunction, the fact that they just had no faith whatsoever. Like if you're the leader of the movement, you're walking into that room to go, hey, listen, I'm starting a movement. I rose from the dead, just like I said, I'm firing all of you and I'm getting new leaders to lead this thing forward because you've been embarrassing this weekend, Right? Instead, he shows up into that room and Luke records it in verse 38 that he said to them, why are you guys troubled? And why do doubts rise in your mind? Why are you still here? Why are you huddled in an upper room apartment? Why don't you have any faith? I told you what I was gonna do. But rather than condemn them, he gave them a reason to believe himself. 
He gave them an object for their faith, not faith in faith, faith in a resurrected savior. He would come to Thomas later who got an unfortunate nickname. Thomas wasn't there. And so the disciples try to tell him about it later. And Thomas is like, I hear you guys, but I'm not gonna believe it unless I can put my hands in the wounds to know that he really is alive. And again, if you're Jesus, you're like, Thomas, forget you. And instead, and this is the invitation to every skeptic, Jesus comes to Thomas and says to him, investigate as far as you need to. Later, Peter would go back to fishing because it's the only thing he knew to try to make a living. Again, what they thought for their future was over. No more Jesus, no more movement. And Jesus is on the beach cooking fish for breakfast. And Peter's on a boat and he recognizes him. And to Peter's credit, always impulsive, jumps out of the boat, swims to the shore as fast as he can, soaking wet, sits down by the fire and Jesus just locks in eyeball to eyeball. He says, Peter, we, we both know. I know what you did. You know what you did. I predicted what you were gonna do. Your faith was not as robust as you thought, but here I am. And he turns to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me, man? Jesus, yeah. I, contrary to what this weekend displayed, I, yeah, I do. And Jesus turns to him again, Peter, you think this is hard? It's about to get a lot harder. And I got a special assignment for you. Are you sure you're all in? You sure you love me? Jesus, I, I swear I do. One more time, just to twist the knife a little bit and make sure that you're ready. Peter, are you willing to follow me all in? You love me? And Peter turns to him and says, Jesus, you, you know my heart. You know I do. And then Jesus looks at Peter. I don't know if you know the end of the story. Knowing that coming behind Peter, there would be generations of skeptics and cynics and doubters and disbelievers that would reignite faith, people with a past, people who thought they were too far gone. And so in this moment, he turns to Peter and rather than put him on probation, rather than condemn him, he says to Peter, I'm gonna put you in charge of the entire movement. And in that moment, when Jesus appeared to those disciples, the movement was ignited and they rolled into the streets of Jerusalem, guys that were cowards, and suddenly they're bold out of their mind, and they're like, you guys crucified him. God raised him. We've seen him. You should repent. And suddenly the movement began to move, and cowards became bold proclaimers. And 2,000 years later, a third of the world connects Jesus to God, Jesus to King. His name, love Jesus, hate Jesus. Jesus' name is dominating the globe today. And that did not happen because of a stolen body. That did not happen because of a made up story that did not happen because they mustered up faith and faith. And that did not happen because of the Bible. There's only one reason we are heralding his name in every generation, in every language all over the globe. And that is because he rose from the dead. And in that moment, it gave every single individual a reason to believe, a reason to have faith, an object for why they should follow Jesus despite their dysfunction, despite their past, despite their questions, in that moment, the movement was born. And 2,000 years later, here we are. And the only reason is a resurrected Savior. In fact, it was the answer to history's greatest mystery. How did it survive? How are we here? It turns out that Jesus was, in fact, a king, God's final king a king of all kings. And unlike other kings, he gave up his life for his subjects rather than requiring his subjects to give up their life for him. And when he walked out of a grave alive, his resurrection validated everything he said about his life and death. Because his resurrection answered another mystery as well. And I think this is something that even if you don't believe in God, there's maybe been a time where you stared up at the ceiling and you wondered about this question, if there is a God. And that's the very personal question of how do I know where I stand with God? The resurrection answered that. How do I know how God feels about me, about my failure, about my sin? Because Jesus is the only one who ever spoke with authority about how God views me, you and the human race. And then he rose from the dead. And John, who's one of the first to get to the empty tomb, writes these really famous words that maybe you know, but they mean nothing without the context of the Easter story. They mean nothing without the resurrection. When John would write this after being with Jesus, God so loved the world. 
And whoever believes in and trusts in him will not be lost to God, will not perish. And then the second part of the verse, it never gets any airplay, but it's so important. Despite what you've experienced, despite how maybe you've been treated by Christians in the church, despite your own past, John would write, God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Jesus. That sin, my dysfunction, the sin of the world, it's a big deal. It cost Jesus his life, but his grace and his love is bigger. And the crucifixion, made no sense until the resurrection. And then it made all the sense in the world. It's why millions of people are gathering in Jesus' name. And I just wanna to talk to you on radio, podcast, or if you're in the room, not knowing your story, but for some of you, the thing that you need to hear is this. If you ever felt like that you were on the outside forever because of your sin, your dysfunction, your doubt. I just want you to know this is the invitation and it has been since Easter weekend. Jesus' response to you is the same response to Thomas and Peter and all the rest. You may have abandoned me, but I will not abandon you. And in fact, because I'm a God of resurrection, the hope for every single one of us this morning is that a resurrected savior can bring purpose and life out of any kind of destruction, out of the ashes of any kind of death. And in fact, the very thing that you may be staring at as abandonment, just like the disciples on Easter weekend, maybe the epicenter of God's greatest activity in your life because we serve a resurrected savior. The thing that you're looking at that looks like disappointment, like them staring into an empty tomb and it looked like disappointment and they had no idea that it was actually disguised destiny, that their worst day was actually the greatest day in heaven, having no idea what God was up to. And in fact, the very thing for you that looks like death, the death of a dream, the death of your future, the death of a relationship, the death of what you thought for your life, because we serve a God who got up out of the grave alive may be the very thing that God is using to bring about life because the resurrection solved the mystery of what does God feel about the human race? And it turns out that Jesus' secret ambition was to die so that you could live and to prove once and for all that he is a king worth following. And one day, not because we just have faith or because we read it in the Bible, but because of a resurrected savior, the king will set up a kingdom that will rule and reign forever. And in that moment, everything that disconnects us to God will bow down to him. We can believe that one day, every tear will be wiped away, that heaven is real, that forgiveness and grace is possible, that one day justice will take place, not because we have faith, but because Jesus promised it. And then he walked out of a grave alive to prove once and for all that he is a king like no other. Because after all, what king would touch a leper skin? What king would open his arms to let the outcast in? And what kind of king would offer mercy in the face of sin? give an opportunity just for a second for some in this moment, and we've had this happen all weekend long, to just say, this is maybe the moment personally for me for the first time. I, just, I believe it's true. And the scripture talks about the good news of Jesus. That's what this weekend is about. It's such good news, but it's so simple. We stumble over it. 
And it's simple, but it's not without cost because it costs Jesus everything. But the good news is that Jesus came and he lived a perfect life that I can't live, you're not gonna be able to live. And then he died on the cross for our sin, past, present, and future. And that didn't make sense to anybody until three days later, he walked out of a grave alive. And that is the hinge point for all of Christianity. It's why we follow Jesus. It gave us a reason to believe, an object for our faith, a resurrection anchored to history. And the scripture says, in fact, Jesus said it one day and John recorded it during his ministry, where he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, trusts in me, will live, will be forgiven. And so I just wanna give an opportunity for some that this is their moment and maybe you didn't even expect it. And it's not without, again, still maybe some skepticism and doubt and questions and wondering about your past, but the resurrection has a way of overriding all of those things. And not that they're not important, but there's just a greater reality that I can bring all of those things with me and believe anyway, because if a guy was able to predict his own death and resurrection and pull it off, then I've got to follow that guy. And the scripture says, when you place your faith and trust in Christ, rather than trying to place your faith and trust and trying to earn your way to God or make sense of your life on your own, that when you make that transfer of trust, you become a son and a daughter of God. And nothing is ever going to be able to separate you from that love. And in fact, I say this all the time, but even if you stumble to the finish line of your life and you never get it together behavior wise, you will stand one day face to face with your resurrected Savior, forgiven, whole and complete because your salvation is not based on your performance. It's based on his. He already did it for you. It's why it's good news. And so all over the house, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? And I understand if you're not religious, this is new for you, that may be weird, but just out of respect for people in this room where this is a moment for them. And I'm gonna invite you, if you're on via radio or podcast to join in this moment, if this is you. But I just wanna lead you in this prayer. And this prayer doesn't save you. It's your own declaration of your faith and your trust. But this, would the, this is the moment where you would say, maybe against all odds, I believe. And so in your own heart and mind, you can pray this after me. Jesus, I believe that you are God. I believe that you lived the perfect life that I couldn't. And then I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And then three days later, you gave me a reason to believe, to have faith. You rose from the dead. And in this moment, I'm not trusting me. I'm trusting you to save me and to forgive me. The scripture says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord in that way is saved, becomes a son, a daughter of the King, the God of the universe. And so with nobody looking around, if this is that moment for you, like so many others this weekend, would you just lift up your hand as a way to just signify an anchor in your own heart? This is the moment that I personally placed my faith and my trust in Jesus to save me, to be my King and my Savior. Just lift up your hand and go, this is the moment for me to place my faith and my trust in him. Yeah, yeah, just leave it up for just a minute. Yeah, 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 yeah. If this is that moment, just leave your hand up for just a second. I'm not gonna ask you to do anything weird to go, this is my moment personally to place my faith and my trust in Jesus. And somebody will put a card in your hand. You don't have to do anything with that if you don't want to, but if you choose to, you can take you to the info center to get information about this new journey. But just in general, I wanna celebrate with you one more time. This is the moment I've placed my faith, my trust in Jesus alone to save me. Jesus, I thank you for what you're doing in this moment. I thank you that we get to be a part of what you've been doing for generations, healing, saving, reconciling, drawing people to yourself. And we recognize in this moment, it is not us, it is you. It's the power of your resurrection. It is the reason that you came to seek and to save the lost. And so I pray for those that in this moment, despite maybe their sin, their doubt, maybe their questions, their dysfunction, their cynicism, that the resurrection and the reality of what you've done has overwhelmed all of that. And they place their faith and trust in you. And so we wanna celebrate that in this moment, literally for 2000 years, people are going from darkness to light, from death to light. And we glorify and we praise the only name worthy of that, the name of King Jesus. Thank you for saving, redeeming and reconciling in, your, in this moment. In Jesus name we pray, amen. And one of 
things we do here is we celebrate really loud when people make decisions. So would you stand and celebrate every single individual who's made a decision to place their faith and their trust in Jesus. This is why we sing and this is why we celebrate a king that is like no other king. Just one breath No other king 